It seems like every month there's an announcement that we've discovered a new habitable planet. But have you ever wondered, how do they actually do that? Are they just taking photos and zooming in like a billion percent? Well, a lot of the science involved is based on the work of 17th century astronomer Johannes Kepler. His three laws of planetary motion explain the beautiful dance that each planet makes around its star. Today, I'll give a simple explanation of these laws, and then we'll look at how we can use them in the hunt for Earth 2, or Earth B, or Earth Strikes Back. So the first law. The orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the Sun at one of the two foci. Every ellipse has two focuses, or foci, as Latin is pretentious. If you draw a line from these two foci to a point on the ellipse, those two lines will always add up to the same length, no matter where you choose the point. The Earth has the Sun as one of the two foci, and because our orbit is pretty circular, those foci are quite close together. The second law. A line segment joining a planet and the Sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Basically, gravity is stronger when two objects are close together and weaker when they're far apart. When a planet is further from the Sun, it moves more slowly. When it's close, it moves quicker. The second law just explains that this ratio is constant. The further the distance, the slower its orbit, and vice versa. The third law. The square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Again, this sounds complex, but really all it's saying is that when you have a bigger orbit, you don't just increase the distance a planet needs to travel. You're also weakening the gravitational force, so it moves much slower. As a rough approximation, if you double the size of the orbit, you triple the time for one orbit. So the mass of the planet is also a factor, but distance is by far the most important. Before we go on, my friend James from the YouTube channel Amor Shiendi is going to tell you the unusual way in which Kepler discovered these three laws. So Kepler is a transitional figure in the history of science. He sits right at the border of mysticism and disciplined rigor. He believed that the universe was constructed by a divine mathematician to be geometrically perfect. He was far from being wealthy and didn't have access to a lot of the instrumentation being developed around the world, so these thoughts remained in the realm of pure mathematics before he moved to Prague and met Tycho Brahe and a bunch of observation data. There, he combined his faith with mathematical leaps of undeniable genius to produce a working formula of planetary motion. Thanks, James. That sounds really cool. You can go check out the entire story on James's channel. I'll link it at the end of this video. But in the meantime, let's get back to our search for Earth number two. So now that we knew how planets behaved, it was time to start looking for more of them. Within our solar system, there were only three planets that were what you would call discovered, as most of them are visible to the naked eye. William Herschel used a telescope to spot Uranus in 1781. Neptune followed in 1846, and it wasn't until 1930 that we confirmed the existence of Pluto. Outside of the solar system, it's possible, though extremely rare, to observe a planet in the traditional sense, meaning you look at an image and see a little object that no one's seen before. Aside from the distance, our atmosphere is a big factor. I mean, air is great and all what with the breathing and sustaining life, but it's a real pain when it comes to space photography. It disperses a lot of the light from other stars, making the images much less clear. So to find planets, the only thing we have to go on is the stars around which they orbit. But from careful observation, we know that these stars actually move a tiny amount. And that's all the data we need. Kepler's laws work on the assumption that the Sun is much heavier than the planets. And it always is. But the mass of the planets also has an effect on the motion of the Sun. Imagine taking a small child by the hands and then spinning around. They'll whiz around you like a little flying squirrel and you'll probably get banned from the playground. But if you do the same with someone your own size, you'll both spin around some point in the middle of the two of you. So you can see that the mass of the objects affect each other. As the Sun is one focus point for every planetary orbit, all those orbits pull a small amount at the Sun, making it wobble. For our Sun, it wobbles about the width of its own diameter. We can look for this wobble in other stars. One way to do this is spectroscopy, which relies on the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect happens to all waveforms. To put it simply, 
Waves that come from an object moving towards you have their peaks squashed together, but the peaks are stretched when it's moving away. So when stars are moving away, the light wave stretches and becomes redder. When they're coming toward us, it's squashed up, so they're bluer. The Doppler effect lets us work out the star's wobble, so we know what planets are orbiting it. So spectroscopy studies the star's colour and allows us to see these changes. Another method is called photometry, and it's even simpler. You just look for a change in brightness. You don't even need the colour. Great news for any dog astronomers. If you notice a regular dip in the brightness of a star, then this shows that some large object is regularly passing in front of it and blocking out some of the light. Alright, so now we can find planets. But how do we know if they're similar to Earth? What's the point of all this if we don't get some kind of intergalactic holiday destination at the end? To work out the chemistry and pressure of a new world, we need transiting planets, meaning ones which pass in front of the star, like when the moon eclipses the sun. In these cases, we can work out the size and mass pretty easily. Then, by turning to spectroscopy again, we look for changes in colour when the planet transits. Some change is due to the planet blocking the star's light, but some is actually the light coming through the planet's outer atmosphere. Thanks to quantum physics, we know what energy levels are absorbed and emitted by every element and molecule, and in every state of heat and pressure. For every atom or molecule, electrons are only allowed in very specific energy states. So when they change state, they give off a unique energy signature, which we see as colours in the light. So just from variations in the colour spectrum, we can make a pretty good estimate about whether a planet has the right temperature, pressure, water content and atmosphere to sustain life. It's just like when you see a man with a light purple shirt and a dark purple tie. You know immediately that he's an estate agent and that you hate him. Thanks for watching guys, go check out the video we did on James's channel and subscribe to Amor Shiendi while you're over there. And you may have noticed the amazing animations in this video, and that's because my friend Tyler from Cadmus VFX did them, so you should go check out his channel as well if you want to see more animations just like them. Everything is linked on screen and in the description. Um, that's all from me, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!